J.T. Crowley is Talking Books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and today on my show, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Eugene de Friest Betty to talk about his book, Collective Amnesia, American Apartheid. He spent 20 years in the U.S. Army and has also served as a church deacon. He presently lives in Winchester, Virginia in the U.S. with his wife, Sheila, who has supported him throughout the entire time he has spent on bringing this book to the public domain, as well as writing other books in the meantime. His close friends, who are African-Americans, and he knows from a lifetime's experience that skin tone plays no part in character or abilities. While he served in the army, he lived and worked alongside soldiers from various ethnic backgrounds. And to him, irrespective of skin color, they were simply soldiers there to do a job. So let's invite him on the show. Jean Betty, come and join me. Thank you, John. Good to be with you. You certainly live a busy life, don't you? Well, it's been an enjoyable life. Yes, I like to read and write. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I've looked at your book. It's very, it's packed full of information and it's absolutely, for me, it's absorbing. It was brilliant. It was, you know, encapsulating and so... Uh, creative. But I've got a couple of questions I want to um, ask you about your book and so that the listeners can get a flavor of what your book is about. Now in your first chapter, Jean, on white supremacy and racism, on page three you talk about racism by saying racism presumes that one of color is superior to another, which results when prejudgal attitudes are combined with a power structure that can and very often do lead to dominatory institutions aspiring to retain control over others. You even hint at European missionaries viewing native people as heathens and savages requiring conversion to Christianity. Why did you start this book with such powerful viewpoints? And why did you choose Robert Jensen, the journalist professor at the University of Texas, as the opening quote? Well, I uh, formed a habit as an intelligence analyst. I sort of collect sayings. And I catalog them, categorize them, and have quite a database. And so I, as I'm writing, I try to find one that encapsulize the whole chapter that I'm going to write because I find it's often good for focusing and Mr. Dr. Jensen's was the most apropos I mean it's really kind of amazing when you think of it the concept of race isn't more than 600 years old when the first British came to America they didn't think of themselves as white they simply thought of, of themselves as Britishers, and likewise Germans, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> the concept of race turned out to be handy dandy when the next chapter comes in, into play, slavery. If you want to enslave an entire, quote, race for life, that's a useful concept. Very interesting you say that because I want to come into chapter two and Jean, which you titled Slavery, America's Peculiar Institution. You open up that chapter with describing how the slave trade operated and the appalling conditions slaves were kept in as they were transported to the so-called New World. The numbers involved and the impact the black African Americans had on the southern states' economies at that time. Would you care to enlighten us, you know, tell the, the listeners why this chapter is so key in your book and why the quote from Marquis de la Fayette. Well, Marquis de Lafayette's quote 
I never would have drawn my sword had I known thereby, thereby I was founding a country built on slavery. It was pretty foundational because arguably the United States would not be an independent country. We would still be possibly, not likely though, still a, a colony of, of Great Britain because Canada is an independent country, but we would have been a colony for a very long time had not the French intervened and, and provided military and naval assistance. So this peculiar in institution, that's something the Southerners call their concept of slavery. It's peculiar in a number of regards, but one of which was uh, they regarded Africans as subhuman. It's the same concept that you alluded to earlier about missionaries <clears throat> regarding the native peoples as subhuman. Mm. So it, it's basically the same, you know, that Christianity found all these people heathens and thus less than human. Uh, so some of the peculiarities of our of American slavery were the owner had no respect, no regard whatsoever for family relationships in, among slaves. In other words, they sold off wives from husbands and children at will for any cause at any time. Uh, Southerners don't like to talk, talk about this now, but mm -hmm. the slave owners had sex with any female they wanted at any time. They even had what they called fancy girls, concubines. In fact, our own very esteemed Thomas Jefferson had a long standing concubine of about 20 years, Sally Hemings, with whom he had six children. He liberated the six of them on his, in his will, but he never failed to count in his inventory which he also inventoried his horses and pigs, <laughs> his, his concubine and his children. I mean, it's, it's kind of a mind blowing fact. Mm -hmm. And the other peculiar aspect of, is it could be maintained only through the greatest coercion force, cruel, extremely cruel whippings, oh. intentionally cruel oh. whippings, Sometimes if the slave ran away, mutilations, many of your viewers will have seen or re possibly remember Roots. Where the I do remember that program, yes. Yeah. But uh, Kente ran away. In fact, I think he ran away several times. But the first time he ran away, they chopped off his toes so he wouldn't run away again. Mm -hmm. And ear chopping off ears was a very common place. I mean, it's a very cruel institution. and. The South has since tried to sugarcoat it. But if you were an African American slave, there was not much positive about it. Other than you, you were guaranteed one set of clothes a year, shoes in the wintertime, and food of low quality. I'd like to take you on to chapter five, and that's headed up emancipation and reconstruction. My understanding of emancipation is the process or fact of being set free from legal, social or political restrictions. Liberation, in other words. So for me, this is an important chapter in your book. That's why I wanted to talk about it. You touch upon emancipation proclamation that came into effect on the 1st of January, 1863. You say many scholars consider the Emancipation Proclamation to be a second American revolution, just as Abraham Lincoln acknowledged a new birth of freedom in his landmarks address at Gettysburg. Can you tell the listener why emancipation and reconstruction is so important to you, so much so you dedicate a whole chapter to this era? Well, emancipation is not very well stood understood in general. First of all, it didn't liberate any slaves at all because it applied immediately, that is. 
because it applied only to slaves in the area controlled by the Confederacy. And they would become free as the Union Army captured territory, which it did quite effectively, in part because of the last sentence of the Emancipation Proclamation, which authorized the recruitment and training of African Americans. That was very significant because by 1863, both sides had killed unbelievable numbers of soldiers, and they were running out of replacements. Now, the South was really in a pickle because they didn't, the reason they seceded was to continue slavery. So there's no way they were going to entertain putting arms in the hands of Black people. And it was a deep prejudice that the North had to get through and overcome is only through the leadership of Lincoln, who, who was, in my view, an incredibly great statesman, but he was at the start equally prejudiced. Uh, but he grew out of that, overthrew it. He recognized the only way the Civil War was going to come to an end was to harness the huge force. I mean, there, there were half a million freemen a large number of whom enlisted, but there were 5 million slaves. That was an immense source of manpower. <clears throat> so that one sentence resulted in 175 regiments, 209,000, 209,000, I forget my integers sometimes, a colossal number. And intelligence people know context is everything. What, is it, what do those numbers mean? Well, 175 regiments, full strength regiments, that was, those were more soldiers than the Confederacy had on all their fronts in every theater in the last six months of the war. They were getting utter, literally down to the bottom of the barrel. And in fact, the effectiveness of the US colored troops finally put him, pushed him to the wall on the 13th of March, 1865. Just barely, the Confederate Congress approved arming blacks. It was very unpopular in the Confederate populace because it clearly negated the reason they seceded to perpetuate slavery. Well, if you're gonna put a weapon in the hand of a slave, <laughs> no rational man would expect that that guy is going to be happy to be a slave when the war is over. I mean, <laughs> so, it, and <clears throat> the Union followed through with the 13th Amendment in 1865 when the war ended that did emancipate all slavery. Said, but although that, that didn't happen overnight, some uh, masters kind of kept it a secret for a while, up to two years in some remote places. They weren't, they weren't eager to lose their free labor. I can understand that. Um, I want to take you on so, now, um, Jean, to um, chapter eight in your book. Now, uh, you embody what you lay behind the Jim Crow laws. This is what this chapter is about. Now, when I researched Jim Crow laws to see why you talk about them in this chapter, they were state and local laws that enforced racial segregation in the Southern US states. Other areas of the US had similar policies, but over time distanced themselves by banning discrimination in public places and voting. But basically, the southern states adopted these laws to ensure black people during the Reconstruction period were disenfranchised from making any political or economical gains. So this chapter is all about laws adapting by the Confederate states, sorry, adopted by the Confederate states to ensure racial segregation in all public facilities was mandatory. This is an important chapter, isn't it? And that's why you put it in. Yes. It is. Uh, and some people think it started right after the end of Reconstruction in 1877. That's not true. It started 
around 1896 with a Supreme Court decision, Ferguson versus Plessy, separate but equal. Of course, separate was never equal, but that started a series of state and local governmental legislation that restricted blacks, oppressed blacks, kept them in their place. Uh, they were so impressive, and impressive, I guess, both, that Hitler sent a lawyer to Arkansas in the 19, early 1930s to study our Jim Crow legislation. And they replicated, the Nazis replicated these laws, although Hitler said, he found some of our practices too offensive. He was referring to lynching, which wasn't legislation. That was extrajudicial punishment slash murder. Ostensibly for rape, but just looking askance at a white person could get you dead. And I used to think it was hanging, but no, they burn people alive. They shot them so many times that, that their bodies turned into pulp and other pleasant things that I will, unpleasant things that I will not <laughs> develop mm. that are read about. Sure. Um, I want to move on um, to chapter 10. As I say, everybody, this is about giving you a flavor of what's in the book. It's not about telling you what's in there. It's a flavor. So is that you would then go and have a look at the book, go and read it, share it, preview. That's the whole idea of this podcast. But chapter 10. Now, this is the civil rights movement, all about this. Uh, 1947 to 1980, redeeming the soul of American. The American civil rights movement was a political movement, and the campaign ran from 1954 to 1968 in the US to abolish institutional racial segregation, discrimination, and disenfranchisement throughout the US. And of course, the movement had its roots in the reconstruction era during the late 19th century, although it made its largest legislative gains in the 1960s. After years of direct action and grassroots protests, this is a very important chapter in your book. And of course, the movement is synonymous with Dr. Martha Martin Luther King Jr. You have some interesting viewpoints here on what you've put in this chapter. Do you want to embroil and broad up what I've just said? Do you want to embellish, explain? Well, I've continued to research since I published that book. And now I find that one, there was never a time that blacks didn't resist one, slavery, and two, the oppression of Jim Crow, meaning blacks were leaders in the abolition movement before the Civil War. Not only, I mean, not solely, but we often think that it was a batch of white people that were the abolitionists. That's not true. Plenty of, for instance, Frederick Douglass is a good example, but there were a lot of clergymen, black clergymen. And some of the veterans from the US colored troops and later from of the Buffalo soldiers objected to being second class citizens. And especially a half million blacks served in the US Army during World War I. They were terribly treated. And when they came home, they both resisted and worked with younger people to get them sensitized mm -hmm. to resist. So it was, and then there, there were a million blacks in World War II who were equally, I mean, our policies hadn't changed a whit, if anything. It was worse in World War II. So those soldiers came home and they were dissatisfied with being second class citizens. I mean, after World War I, 10 soldiers were lynched simply for being wearing their uniform. It's mind bending to me as a retired army soldier. 
Anyway, so it, it was ongoing, and particularly after World War II and the Nuremberg war crimes, and the myth of this, you know, Aryan supremacy and white supremacy. I mean, they're kind of analogous. They're, they're identical in my view, but some might quibble. It became a great embarrassment. In fact, the Nazis and the communists latched onto this as a great propaganda point, you know? And there's no propaganda that's more effective than that that happens to be true. I mean, we were. You can argue about it, dance about it, argue back and forth, but we were hypocrites. All men are created equal, but we got this second class batch of people because of the color of the skin. Oh, so for, fortunately, Harry Truman, President Truman, who is a much underrated US president, but he's a lot of other things and um, don't relate to this, including the formation of NATO and the Marshall Plan. But he wrote an executive order directing the integration of the armed forces in 1948. Now, a lot of people say he integrated the armed forces in 1948. Nothing could be further from the truth. The only armed service that integrated was the newly formed Air Force, because they had, they were too young, too new to have ingrained traditions. But the army, I am ashamed to say, resisted with might and main and the last segregated army unit was integrated in 1954, that's six years later. So in the civil slash religious realm, there were a lot of people who, it was not just, I mean, the human mind has to latch on to simple things, I think. So yes, Martin Luther King did a lot of great things and he deserves recognition. But he was supported by hundreds of black, white, brown, native Indians. A lot of people knew that this system was immoral. I mean, frankly, it's not Christian. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So that's why there was change. I mean, because if you look at the system, the Jim Crow system as it existed, before the civil rights movement, no one would have thought that it could change. It was pretty entrenched. Mm. That's just the way people fought and, and they, were, they were supported by laws. Mm. I have one of the quotes I use, in, I think it's a later book, is never forget that everything that Adolf Hitler did was legal. He knew he passed laws that made it legal. And I'm sure everything that Mr. Putin right now is doing is, according to him, legal. I want to go to your last chapter, um, which you summarize, I think, very well. I just want to read a portion that I'm going to ask you for your comment. I'm going to read this bit here. So I'm just going to go here. This is chapter 12, everybody. It's called Conclusions and Wither America. The treatment offered African Americans in North America since they first landed at Point Comfort, Virginia in 1619 hardly comports with the popular story most Americans choose to believe about our country. Every American knows that blacks were enslaved up to the Civil War, but fear of the snow, any detail, the horrors of the system, much less what ensued after Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation on January the 1st, 1863. From our vantage point of more than 150 years and counting, it is difficult to appreciate the effect this second American Revolution, Lincoln's new birth of freedom, had on the course of America's development. Tragically, for most blacks, it was all too short-lived and then became a nightmare. The death of an economic system based on forced labor was incredibly dislocating and of tremendous consequence for American four years of increasing Bloody and bitter war had been fought over this issue, and an entire economic system, a way of life, was forcefully eradicated. But sudden prejudices and bigotry ensured continued oppression of blacks, and slavery was ultimately replaced by a system apartheid termed Jim Crow, 
a system just as insidious and degrading for African Americans as slavery had been. Bigotry in the North was almost as pervasive, if somewhat less virulent, and Northern indifference was ultimately the key to the South's time. Why did you put that in the book? Because it's true. And we need to know that. I mean, it has never ceased to amaze me since I started researching this eight years ago. <laughs> the world went crazy when South Africa and Rhodesia practiced apartheid for, I guess, around 15 years. The United States practiced it for over 100. Jim Crow. Uh, 60, maybe, depending on how one counts, but if you count from after the Civil War onward, certainly it was 100 years, because white Southerners never saw a black man as their equal, no, no how, no way. And one of the things that Hitler admired about the United States was our ability to dance out of this and not be seen as villains on the world stage. And one amazing fact is, unbeknownst to most of us white guys, only about 25% of the world is white. And one has to wonder what the other 75% think about our behavior. And I wrote it mostly because it's necessary for us to change our ways. We, you know, racism has been a tremendous cost. Time wrote magazine about two decades back wrote the biggest loss <clears throat> to national U.S. national resources is the underemployment of African-Americans because they have the highest job unemployment rates. They have difficulty getting jobs. They have last tired, first fired, and they are mostly in menial jobs, have been at least up to this time. We making great strides now, but we really need to be aware of what happened and the consequences. So is that why you wrote a children's book? It is because I would say that most of us, I, I'm including myself, and I think I'm an average guy, are clueless. I mean, we get taught about you. I mean, there are two choices of what caused the Civil War, states' rights, and slavery. Well, states' rights is a batch of twaddle. I mean, that's something that the <clears throat> South came up with because after they lost the war to preserve slavery, it was kind of an embarrassment that that was why they fought and lost. I mean, of course, the wor world had gone on. Uh, for instance, Great Britain abolished slavery in 1833. So fighting a four-year war from 61 to 65 was not exactly guaranteed to uh, win favor across the world anyway. And in retrospect, after you lost, it's definitely a non-starter. You want to come up with another cause. Yeah, it's important that children understand you know, what's happened in the past so that it doesn't repeat in the, in the future. That's my view. So I think that's yours as well, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not, not, it's not about rubbing anyone's nose in anything. It's about appreciating what actually happened and understanding the consequences. And a, another thing is black contributions have been largely ignored in our history books. And I don't know the causes, I'm not a genius, but I suppose it's because white people thought that blacks couldn't have possibly accomplished anything great, but they have. And just as it's fair to give whoever invents or advances human knowledge credit, it's, it doesn't matter what their color is. They should be recognized. I and totally agree. They have, blacks, blacks have done some incredible things, like the electric brake on railroads and elevators. And I won't babble on, but there are many things. Absolutely. Check out my my. I've written a follow-on book to collective amnesia, far more comprehensive, probably too voluminous because it's prone to 700-something other pages, but I call that African-Americans in American history, 
1526 to the present. Because it turns out, well, actually, African Americans were in North America before the first Anglo Saxon. They came with the Spanish. So possibly we're a little bit too Anglo Saxon oriented. No, of course, no um, that's just a, a fact. Yeah, of course. Um, you, there's another book, um, Forbidden, Forgotten, for, Formidable Blacks in America's Wars. Um, and your opening gambit in that book is Despite centuries of oppression and abuse, African Americans remained loyal to the United States, fighting for this country even as slaves when they did not enjoy full citizenship. White supremacy has always played a major role in our history, distorting our potential as a nation. Not until recent times have blacks experienced anything like a level playing field in the military or society, as this book graphically demonstrates. Is this a statement or is this your view? It's a true fact. I mean, when we finally allowed blacks to serve, <clears throat> they had to have white officers with very few exceptions. There were three black graduates at West Point, but <laughs> that's very few exceptions. Uh, until World War I, then, then we finally allowed a black OCS. So then there were fairly large numbers of black officers. But when, when we got rid of segregation in 1956 and opened up, I mean, amazing things have happened. Now, now I don't remember statistics very well off the top of my head, but now there are a couple hundred cadets of color, females included, at all of our service academies. And Colin they're doing, Powell? I mean, yes, Colin Powell. And mm -hmm. at the moment, our Air Force Chief of Staff, that means the, the commander of the Air Force, yeah. is a black man. Sure. <clears throat> now, I forget his last name but anyway. And our Secretary of Defense is a retired four star general. Absolutely. Lloyd Austin III. I mean, if that's not progress plus, being a retired intelligence bean counter officer, I have an appendix in that book that lists 400 general officers since 1940. So what's I next mean, for you? Sometimes it's good to count the beans. Oh no, 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 no. What's next for you? What's coming down the pipeline with other books are set for the two books? Well, I'm happy to say I've actually got a traditional publisher for that Forbidden, Forgotten, Formidable. Ooh. It'll be coming out in a year. But I decided to lighten, well, I'm still working on the, I keep adding to the, trying to improve the children's book and the American, African Americans in American history, because there's always new facts to discover that make it more and more and more convincing case. But I decided to get off that topic for a bit. I have a friend whose great, great grandfather was a Jesse Scout. Jesse Scouts were Union Cavalry who frequently wore Confederate uniforms and would sidle into the Confederate bivouacs and jawbone with the troops. And yeah, they were essentially, they were spies. And at least one was hung when he was caught. They also, the Jesse Scouts went with Sheridan, General Sheridan, who was commander here in the Shenandoah Valley went to the Mexican border in the Army of Observation after the Civil War, because we were a little bit concerned that the French were introducing Austrian Archduke Maximilian. They wanted him to take over the country. So the Jesse Scouts went down there. This is a very interesting story. And the last book about Jesse Scouts was published in 1905. So. I think that might be fertile ground. And at any rate, my friend has got documents that just from the family, in addition to all the stuff that's been published before. So where can people get your books from? I'm sorry? Where can people get your books from? Oh, the published books are available on my website, genebatee.com, and the usual suspects, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Books a Million. I like how I said the usual suspects. <laughs>
Um, I just want to end with a testimonial from Dennis J. Quinn. This gives you all an, a, a really good summary of what this book is about. So Dennis J. Quinn, Colonel, US Army retired and former instructor at the National War College, said in his written testimonial about collective amnesia, this is an important book for all Americans who want to know the whole of American history. Dr. Batiste chronicles the entire 400 year story of African slaves and their American descendants from colonial time to today. This book primarily focuses on the trials and tribulations of that long journey, a journey that must be learned by each new generation or both blacks and whites. Here in one book today, Americans can come to know that story. And I just need to add to that and say, this book is not just for Americans, it's for everybody. So I'm going to say to Dr. Jean Padet, thank you so much for coming to my show. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to have a look at his ingenious, incredible, mind-blowing book. And I hope all you guys will go and have a look as well, because it is well worth a read. So as I say at the end of my each podcast, I'm JT Crowley. Thank you for listening. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe. Thank you.